Um, so, um, like Sabrina said, I like to to dive into uh, gene expression um, across different uh, platforms and in different ways. Um, and so um, today I'll tell you about two of them. One of them is the spatial transcriptomics work we've done since last year. And another one is basically like, uh, like um, analyzing data uh, in large scale. Um, um, and so um, at the end also like, I'm, like I do other things related to R, uh, like Sabrina mentioned. So like my little logo over here, the idea of it is like, I like to, to connect communities together. Um, so if you have any questions about Biconductor or, or some of the other communities I'm involved in, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, so let me, uh, also the slides, I have them on, sorry, on speaker deck, if you want to, to see them uh, uh, later. So <clears throat> the place I work at, um, the Liberty Institute for Brain Development is highly interested in psychiatric disorders that we can see here in the top right. Um, and how can we um, understand uh, more about psychiatric disorders, um, biologically speaking, uh, involves multiple layers of molecular biology. Uh, the one we focus on, on the most is the transcriptome, which is um, um, the RNA the, um, molecules uh, in, a, in a given cell um, or across cells. Um, there's many different RNA molecules, but we are mostly trying to study the messenger RNA molecules. Um, and we can actually um, measure this, uh, the presence of these molecules um, in different contexts, in different transcriptomic contexts. You can uh, try to study it across time. So that, that would be like across developmental stages. Um, like once you have, so then you can try to also like look at it across different cell types um, in a given, in a given uh, snapshot of time. Um, you can try to build networks with the genes. You can also try to look at where the genes are like being active across um, spatial regions of the brain, which I'll tell you more about. Um, or you can also look at um, differences across sex. So uh, the, the challenge that we have is that uh, we can only measure the activity of, of, of genes or these mRNA molecules um, in very specific ways, right? Like, like it's not like we can uh, measure a sing, um, the information for a given individual across uh, multiple time points because the human brain like you can't just um, extract a little piece of it, right? It's not like blood. Um, um, so looking at developmental changes is challenging because you have to look at them across individuals instead of inside a single individual. Um, but then if you take a, a, a slice of the tissue, um, it actually is composed by many different cell types and those cell types uh, can change a lot depending on what part of the brain you're in. So there's a lot of different uh, complexities to, to uh, analysis of transcriptomic data in, the, uh, in terms of psychiatric disorders, but in general um, um, uh, in the human. And so uh, we, we mostly study the brain. That's because, uh, I mean, the brain controls a lot of functions of the human body but it's also like the, the tissue of the, of the human body that it has been associated with like psychiatric disorders. In particular, the dorsal, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex over here. Um, it controls like um, uh, perception, awareness, thought, memory, but uh, disruptions in the also lateral prefrontal cortex have been associated with psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, which is one of the main um, psychiatric disorders of interest for the uh, institute where I work. And so we look inside uh, the, uh, the dorsal, the DLPFC, that's the acronym for the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, it actually has this laminar organization. So we can see here on the left, some images that show the different cell bodies. Um, and using this type of data, you know, researchers classified them into uh, six different uh, subcortical regions. And these regions have different properties. For example, like layer one um, is known to have a lot of the dendrites. So that's the, the end portions of the neurons. Um, while like layer five has like large uh, pyramidal uh, neurons, um, like the bodies of them. 
Um, and so you, you imagine getting like gene expression data from layer one, um, even though maybe it's uh, part of the same neuron, right? A very long neuron that spans multiple uh, layers. The expression that we see in layer one is gonna be different than we see in like layer five. Um, so there's a couple of different technologies that exist now for, for measuring gene expression at uh, very fine resolutions. So this is like really like zoomed in. Um, one of them is single cell um, gene expression, um, which has been around for a couple of years now. And recently in, in, in recent years there's been a, a development for generating spatial transcriptomics platforms. And one of them in particular is the Visium platform from a company called 10X Genomics. And what this platform uh, provides is uh, you buy like these little squares that are six millimeters by six millimeters. Um, and each of them has uh, around 4,000 spots. Those spots are 55 micrometers in diameter. And the idea is that in that single spot, you can uh, measure um, uh, the expression of the cells that are in that spot. So for us, on average, it might be around three cells per spot based on the, um, um, on, on the size of the cells that we're looking at in the DLPFC. Um, but it, like, like, let's say you're looking at a, a mouse, for example, you might have a lot more cells because the, the cells there are smaller than a human. Um, so at that resolution of like, like, like really like small, like localized um, spots, right? We're able to measure the expression um, in, inside of them. Um, and so this was our like pilot study. We actually uh, partnered with uh, 10X Genomics to, to do this, um, this first study using Visium data. Um, and we chose the DLPFC because we know that, that there are six layers plus white matter uh, that we should be able to observe uh, using the Visium platform. Uh, so we, this is a, a scenario where we kind of knew what was the answer, what the answer was going to be, right? Um, um, but like there was also like a, a time pressure component of trying to like do a, a good a good analysis but do it fast, right? Um, and so that's where also like from my perspective of like uh, uh, on like bringing our code into the picture, like all the different projects that I've done in the past helped me a lot for this project. Uh, so for example, like learning Shiny, um, our Shiny um, in the past helped me to then make a little website that I'll talk a little bit more um, uh, in the next set of slides. And so what, what, we're, what we do here is, what we did in this project, sorry, with uh, Kristen Maynard, who you can see here on the top right, was to identify um, genes that have uh, expression profiles that are rich for certain layers of the DLPFC. Uh, but then we wanted to tie in the, the data that we generated at this spatial resolution with the single cell uh, data that uh, is available. Um, and uh, we wanted to see if some of the genes that have been um, implicated in psychiatric disorders, if they had a, a layer uh, specific pattern. Um, so the, the exact data that we had was uh, we had uh, three different uh, brain donors, so three different subjects, and from which we uh, obtain um, like a block of tissue, um, this is like really small, right, um, from the DLPFC. Uh, and the idea, this, these dissections were done in such a way that uh, visually they should uh, contain layers one through six and a little bit of white matter. Uh, and because we, this was the first time that we were using this new assay, we wanted to make sure that everything, you know, that the assay was like trustworthy. Um, and so in order to evaluate that, we generated what we call spatial replicates. So we, if you imagine this being like a piece of ham, uh, like we cut one slice, then we cut in a slice immediately after it. So it's like zero micrometers of distance between one and the other. And then after that, we, we move further into our piece of ham and 300 micrometers away, we then cut two more slices next to each other. And so in total, we had uh, 12 samples, uh, 12 visium samples here to, to work with. Um, and like I said, this, uh, this project involved um, um, uh, people from 10X Genomics. Um, 
and then it also involved uh, like a very diverse team for us, which involved like, for example, uh, me like that has more like art experience, um, Kristen Maynard who um, had a lot has a lot of experience with like uh, the develop like using these experimental assays, um, um, along with Kerry Martinovich. We then brought in Stephen Hicks and Lucas Weber from the uh, Hopkins Department in, bi in Biostatistics. Um, because like we also needed like uh, help with like new methods uh, for this work. Um, um, and so the data that we have here, uh, this image on the left shows a slice of the tissue that we were able to, to generate. Then you can, um, that like that was provided to us. Um, then you can uh, immunostain it to see like where are the cell bodies. And so the idea is like, we expect here to have the white matter on the bottom left for this particular sample and, and the six different layers um, in a diagonal in, a, um, in that direction. Um, and so once we generated the gene expression data, then we we're able to visualize it now using our code. Uh, and so here are, for example, three different uh, genes that are known to be um, um, expressed in different cell types. So for example, SNAP25 is expressed mostly in neurons and we expect layers one through six to be mostly like um, dominated by neurons. So that's why we see like high levels of expression here shown in, in, in orange and red. Um, MOBP is, is a gene that is mostly expressed in white matter. So you see it mostly here on, on the bottom left corner. And then like PCP, PCP4 is a gene that is mostly expressed in um, layer five. So you kind of see it, you can kind of see the, the layer here. Right, um, like a little arc, um, um, and so uh, across all the the twelve replicates here, for example, we're looking at uh, PCP4 across all of them, um, um, and so we can see that the spatial replicates, which are columns one and two, and then three and four, um, look really similar uh, across the different subjects, which are on the rows. So this uh, probably provided us some level of confidence on the on the Visium um, assay platform um, that it was like generating like reproducible results or, or results that can be replicated. Because um, um, we mostly see the same pattern across across the different slices. Um, they do change a little bit because like you're you're not looking at exact exactly the same cells, right? Like your the slice of tissue has a. a um, a little height to it, right? So you can't just see like the same cell um, across the two slices, right? Um, um, but like the pattern, the pattern seems to hold here. Um, so that like this type of data can get really big um, in a sense. Uh, so we have around like 40,000 spots um, or so um, across 33,000 genes. So that's a fairly large matrix, but a lot of it is actually zeros, so it's uh, very sparse. Uh, and so in order to, to use it for, uh, for our downstream analysis, we compress that, the data using a pseudo bulking, which is when you sum up the expression levels. Here, the genes are on the rows. We have the different spots on the columns. Um, and so we, we summed up the expression levels for a given gene across all the spots from a, from a given image here uh, for a given layer. Now, the layers here were um, uh, manually, like all the spots here were manually assigned to a given layer using different pieces of information uh, with the Shiny app um, that I developed and with um, uh, expertise from uh, Kristen Maynard um, um, and like, like information about previous marker genes. So once you assign the spots to a layer, we're able to compress the data. And then looking at the compressed data here on a, on a PCA plot, we see that um, layer one through layer six um, are mostly explained in the PC number two, which explains 9% of the variance. And then white matter, which is the great points versus the neuronal layers, explains around 34% of the variance. Um, so this was kind, kind of neat to see because actually like, Layer one is followed by layer two, then three, then four, then five, and then six. So it's kind of nice to see this pattern um, on the PCA plot. Um, 
to find the, the genes that are enriched across the different layers. And then we, we ran like three different statistical models. Um, so there's a really like, one of them is like an F test, then two of them are T tests. Um, and so that's because at this point we have simplified the data to um, seven different categories. So the six layers plus white matter. Um, and we have a couple, uh, we have 12 points maximum per category. And we're trying to find genes that are, that have expression patterns or maybe just any layer is different from the rest. That, that's what we call the ANOVA model. Um, we also uh, ran what we call the enrichment model where, it's, where it's, we're comparing a given layer against all the other layers. Um, and then the third model, which is we're doing like pair, pairwise comparisons. And why do you want to do this? <clears throat> that's because like, um, some marker, some of the genes that you might be interested in uh, might have really different profiles, like like white matter, uh, like let's say MMOVP over here, um, is much highly expressed in a white matter compared to the rest of the layers, right? So there's a clear pattern there, uh, but some other genes might not have such a clear pattern. Maybe like they're expressed in um, uh, several layers, but they have a strong difference between let's say layer uh, six and five, right? Um, um, and that's because of the, of the complexity of, of, the, of the brain. Um, and so using this approach, uh, we were able to identify uh, like previously known marker genes. And a lot of these previously known marker genes come, come from um, um, mouse studies. Um, and so for example, here, PVAL-B is a gene that is known to be um, expressed highly on layer four. So we do see that gene over here at a higher level of expression there. Uh, here's a plot for one of the 12 um, Bezium slides that we have, where you can kind of see it, um, um, the spatial pattern for at the spot level. Um, and uh, on the right side, we're showing data from the um, Allen Human Brain Atlas um, that also shows like that particular gene, PLB, is in a different technology. Um, and it's a um, spatial um, pattern of expression. Um, and so similarly, we can do this for other genes. So here, for example, CCK, eh, CCK that shows a strong difference between layer six and white matter. Um, it's also expressing other layers. So that's why at the spot level plot, it looks um, like it's like expressing um, you know, a lot of places, uh, but it's, um, it has a big contrast between the white matter where it's like mostly um, not as expressed, and layer six, which where it's um, highly expressed. Um, so that's, you know, this at, up to up until now, we're just uh, validating uh, uh, previous knowledge. Um, but then we can also we also found like new uh, marker genes, um, such as um, uh, Trav BD2A for layer five. And the way that we validated these new marker genes was using um, RNA scope. So at this point, this is um, imaging, where you you take images of a of a slice of tissue. We actually took it from the next slice on the same tissue block, um, and so you immunostain um, um, for different for these different genes. You can't just do it for every single gene, like um, the RNA scope uh, company. Uh, they give you a list of genes that they have um, markers for. And so here we can see a uh, TRAB BD2A that has like uh, higher intensity points in this, um, in this image on what we think is layer five over here based on the density of, um, of the cells. Um, so um, you know, every new technology, right? Uh, has different um, costs and um, and um, and uh, labor associated uh, uh, time. So, uh, like the Vision platform that we're using is genome wide. Uh, the RNA scope platform here on the right is not genome wide. You have to choose specifically what genes you want to generate data from, um, and so. Uh, you have to always mix and, mix and match a little bit like the different technologies that we have to try to you know, make sure that you can trust the new technology based on maybe the, the older one that might be not as high throughput or, um, 
or more time consuming, right? Um, so that's what we've done over here. Um, and so now that we have some new marker genes, we are now going to try to um, register the expression of of um, of the genes uh, between and basically like match what we have on the single nucleus level versus the information that, that we just generated at the spatial um, uh, resolution. So now we have genes that we know are um, enriched for expression across multiple layers of the RAIN. But um, you might also have um, data from a single nucleus um, project that allows you to measure expression at a single cell that every point on the left side is a single cell. And uh, they, you can group them into, into clusters. And next, we are going to try to answer like which of these clusters seems to have a higher expression in what of the layers, you know, which of the layers that we that we measure. Um, and so the way we do this um, is uh, first you start with your single cell or single nucleus RNA seq data. You're going to do like the standard analysis of pre-processing the data, identifying the clusters, um, and then you're going to have um, typically what people do right now is like they find marker genes across these clusters and then based on the literature of what those marker genes are known to be related to you can assign your clusters um, like some functional some functionality right so you might say like oh like this cluster over here seems to be enriched for genes that are expressed on oligodendrocytes for example which is one of the cell types um, and so that's like the process right now and so here we're um, we actually have also some data ourselves on single nucleus RNA-seq. Um, um, and if you want to compare it with our data, uh, we already sued a bulk our data. So that was like we compressed our um, spatial data um, across all the six layers plus white matter. Um, in our case, not all of the layers were present in every single sample. So that's why instead of the 12 times seven, um, um, columns that we ex expected on the pseudo bulking process. Uh, so that would have been 84. We actually only got 76. And that's because our second subject um, had some layers that were missing. Um, and that has to do with like the dissection of the tissue. Um, so that's how we compress our data. And you can do the same, it's a very similar process with a single cell or single nucleus RNA seq data, where you might have your uh, cell, cell or nucleic clusters. And you might have other variables that you're going to be able to group your data by, right? So maybe you have multiple subjects, um, or um, maybe you, you actually have some other um, experimental structure to the data that you generated. And so you're, we, if you compress your data using the pseudobulking approach, now that we have the two pseudobulk approaches, um, what we, we what we need is to uh, use the enrichment model to find genes that have higher expression in a given layer or in the case of the single nucleus RNA-seq in a given uh, cluster uh, compared to the rest. So we run this model in, on both. Um, and so that will give you uh, T statistics for both, for the spatial data and the single nucleus RNA-seq data. Now that you have all these T statistics, uh, if, you, if we concentrate on um, the genes that are that have a strong T statistics in our um, um, layer level data, right? We can then correlate the T statistics that we observe in um, in our spatial data versus the T statistics from the single nucleus RNA seq data. And so this this heat map over here is showing the correlation, right? That goes from minus one to one. Um, high values are shown in darker green. And so now the interpretation of this type of plot is like, okay, you want to find the, the cells in this heat map that have uh, high correlation values. Um, and so there's some things that are like easy in this sense because like white matter um, compared to the layers one through six has a very different like cellular composition. It's mostly composed of oligodendrocytes. So this result over here in the bottom left corner is kind of expected. Uh, I mean, is expected. Um, so it's nice to see that it, like all the different in this particular data set, they have uh, five different oligodendrocyte clusters. 
all of them highly correlate with white matter. But like, for example, um, they have over here a, uh, several excitatory neuron uh, clusters on the single nucleus RNA seeking site. And we can see that um, um, cluster two, zero, four, and six uh, are mostly correlated or expressed in uh, layers two and three uh, of the DLPFC. And so that's the type of resolution that you might not have had before just from the single nucleus RNA seq data. Like maybe you had a marker gene that like uh, on a mouse study seemed to be enriched in like layer two, right? Um, so you can potentially label it as, um, as a layer two um, um, cell cluster. But now with this type of data, you're able, we're able to like assign the, um, uh, the layer of the brain for each of these exc um, excited neurons. Like some of the other ones here are like either expressed on layer four or layer five. Um, so that's um, like a way of trying to bring in the data that we have from these two high throughput technologies. Um, like uh, remember that on the spatial data, we're looking at expression across um, a spot that is 55 micrometers in diameter that can contain more than one cell, right? So it's not truly like, like that. Uh, the spatial transcriptomics um, platform is not um, um, truly like um, single cell resolution. And so that's why you might need to combine the two, the two assays. Um, so here, this is just another uh, data set uh, where we can see like a similar type of pattern, like the oligo uh, clusters are like um, highly correlated with the white matter. Um, and some of the excitatory neurons, they go for different layers. Um, and so if you wanted to do this yourself, this is the link to the Shiny app. Um, um, that we, that we made for this project. And so the spot level data panel, that's the one we use for actually assigning every single spot to a layer. But then the layer level data uh, tab of the Shiny app is where um, if you have your own like single nucleus RNA-seq data, you can upload your enrichment to statistics and it will provide you the plot. Um, so you basically just need to like save this T statistics into like a, a tab uh, the limited text file where you have your gene IDs on the rows, your different clusters on the columns with the T statistics. Um, um, you just upload it to the on, on Shiny and then it will make this plot for you, right? Um, um, so that's um, like speaking from our from the R side, uh, this is like a very um, simple thing to provide, but it actually um, and gives a lot of value to, to the research community that um, has been generating like single nucleus RNA-seq uh, for different, uh, you know, DLPFC studies. Um, um, so this can actually help, I think, uh, your projects, your papers, if you're able to provide like a little like uh, resource um, utility beyond just telling people like, oh, here's the data, here's maybe some code you can run to try to make these graphs, right? Um, um, and so on a similar way, we also looked at um, genes that are associated with psychiatric disorders. And people might identify these, these set of genes uh, through multiple different uh, projects. So for example, they might like create lists, they might uh, look at GWAS or TWAS results. They might have like genes that are different um, uh, associated with psychiatric disorders because of differential expression studies, et cetera. Um, and so all of these gene lists, we can then uh, check if they have a high uh, odds ratio of enrichment for our genes that are um, region specific, sorry, layer specific. And so one particular example here is with ASD, um, autism spectrum disorder, where there's a couple different studies, one of them from 2013 that uh, found some genes associated with autism, um, um, and we can see that the Safari one has a strong enrichments in layers two, five, and six. But then there's a newer uh, study from 2020 where they found 102 diff, um, genes associated with ASD. And so if we look at that over here, we see that also we get layers two and five, but that in, in this particular study, they break up the 102 genes into two different categories. Um, 
some of them they call them ASD dominant traits, and uh, the other ones they call them neurodevelopmental delay associated genes. And we can actually see now that like the um, the dominant ones uh, they are mostly in region layer five, while the neuro neurodevelopmental delay ones are in, in region layer two. So that's like uh, like a type of um, like a result that we didn't have before, right? So like knowing like what particular uh, layer of the DLPFC these genes are playing a role in. Right? Um, so that is just like one step forward towards um, understanding um, these psychiatric disorders. Um, it's not like, so this was a pretty cool result for us uh, or interesting result. So, um, 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 looking at the time. So um, something else that we wanted to do was also like work on the method side um, to try to see if we can do a better job of, of finding these, um, assigning each of the spots to a given layer. And so um, uh, what we can do is we can try to find either spatially or highly variable genes. Um, we can then do like spot level clustering and all this um, either supervised or, or semi-supervised methods, uh, sorry, unsupervised or semi-supervised, uh, we can compare them to the manual annotation. And why we wanted to do this, um, right now we only had 12 samples, so you can actually manually annotate them. But in the future, we might have a lot more, right? Um, so we're actually working on generating new samples. Um, and here's like a caveat, like for example, you can, you can find spatially, um, 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 genes that have a spatial pattern. So like, for example, MOBP over here. So that one is like, oh yes, that's, that's a gene of interest, right? Because it's um, a white matter gene or PCP4, which is a layer uh, five gene. Uh, but you can also find genes like HBB, um, MPY, et cetera, that have spatial patterns. Um, however, these actually seem to correspond to, to, to blood flow. So there's, they're not really the genes you, you might be interested in. They don't have like um, uh, like a strong relationship to to the um, to the cell types. It's just like where blood is flowing into the brain in this particular um, in this particular uh, slice of tissue that we have. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful of that. And one way of seeing it is in this plot where the y-axis shows the spatial um, the statistic, the x-axis show, shows this our ANOVA model. And so some genes over here. Um, don't have as, as, as strong a, a, as a signal from our normal model, but they do have a very strong like spatial uh, signal. Um, and that, those are like these blood genes, for example. Um, so like we think that the field uh, is just really getting started in how to find um, uh, how to cluster the data um, across spots, um, how to find like, like similar sets of spots that uh, have, you know, um, um, consistent like expression patterns um, and like do it in a way that like, uh, that, you know, seems to make sense, right? So we can, you know, we can run like clustering algorithms like completely unsupervised. And like here we're like, oh, well, this, you know, seems to make sense a little bit like the bottom left, we do see a bit of the white matter, but like, um, uh, this middle region is a bit more um, messier, right? Um, you can try to use semi-supervised methods um, um, where in this case, we didn't have any other external Visium data, right? So we had to use our own data. So this is not, not um, a realistic scenario, but in the future, once we have new data, new DLPFC data, we'll be able to use our old data, um, select the, um, our uh, layer and rich genes and then apply it to the new data. Um, uh, so I think the semi-supervised way is potentially what will be most helpful in the future. Or you can just use like no marker genes, which we, we see that is just, um, it doesn't give you a great picture either because a lot of these no marker genes are from uh, the mouse um, and they might not be marker genes in human or they might not be expressed in human, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Like here was um, like, this is a summary comparison across multiple methods that we tried. Um, 
where you can um, um, give it spatial information. So you can give it information um, about like where the spots are located at. Um, and uh, it seems to be like all the different methods uh, or, or several of them actually seem to be doing better when we provide some spatial information. Um, however, like there's already another paper out that used our data to develop a new method that outperforms anything of anything that we did here. Um, so, but it, it, it was good to see that they, they actually use the same metrics that we uh, came up with for how to measure performance. Um, so, um, I think, like I said earlier, this field of, of clustering spots is, um, is just getting started. Um, and so um, the Shiny app and the Bioconductor package that provides access to all of the data, uh, um, you know, I think it's actually quite helpful for the field. And just that method that I mentioned, that like outperforms ours, they were able to make it um, because we provided the data publicly at a point uh, in February of last year when we uh, submitted our, our preprint of the paper. Um, and because of all the, you know, the pandemic and the peer review process, the paper is actually just gonna get published maybe uh, next week, right? So almost a year after. Um, and I think this is just an example of like, if you make the data and the code public, other people can greatly benefit. And, and like we benefit in, in return, right? From, having access to new methods that we can now use um, at a much faster uh, rate than we only uh, published, um, or like if we only shared the data like after the, uh, the paper was uh, fully published. Um, so, um, so with this, I think like this was our pilot study. Uh, we are convinced that uh, the vision platform works and uh, that we can find layer specific marker genes. Um, we can we have a way now of combining um, our layer spatial uh, our spatial transcriptomics data with the single cell data, and we are already seeing that it can help us understand some disorders um, like the ASD example that I mentioned. Um, and so we're really excited about this. Uh, we got like a couple of grants last year, uh, and we're in the process of generating our own data now by ourselves instead of, uh, um, instead of uh, working with 10X genomics. Um, um, and so there's, you know, there's a learning curve um, uh, associated with like uh, generating the data ourselves. And we're in the middle of that. So like in the aspect of zooming in into gene expression at like, and trying to get as close as we can to um, the cell level data or the, or the different components of the brain I think these technologies will be really helpful for that. Um, just in the next couple of minutes, I'll tell you about the other project, Recount Tree, which is a, like in a very, it's zooming in, but in a very different direction. It actually like, you could say like it's zooming out. And that's because everyone shares data, or I mean, they're supposed to share data um, through the sequence read archive um, or other resources. So there's a lot of public data on, the, on SRA. Um, there are, these, uh, there are these other big projects, GTEx and TCGA, uh, that have generated thousands of samples of RNA-seq data, uh, bulk RNA-seq. Um, and so uh, um, we um, wanted to quantify the expression in a uniform way across all the public uh, data that we could get our hands on. And so one version of this project was published in 2017, where we were, were able to quantify gene expression not only at the gene level, but also like at the different exons, um, different exon exon junctions, and uh, and generate base level coverage, coverage profiles such that we can study uh, unexpressed, sorry, unannotated regions of the brain, right? So regions, well, not only of the brain of the human body, um, so regions of the genome that were not known previously to be expressed, right? Um, so. Uh, and we want to do it uniformly. That way, you can you'll be able to compare um, results across different studies without having like artifacts introduced because you're using different um, um, software solutions for processing the data. Um, and the initial version of this project called Recon is from 2011, which at that time had data for just 20 studies, and was like 
useful for other um, biostatisticians and bioinformaticians for generating new methods. So this is Mike Love, the author of the BEC2 uh, paper uh, and, and our package, well, Biconductor package, which is like widely used. Um, and so he used recounts back in the day for developing his method um, just because like having access to a lot of data uh, enabled him to, to evaluate whether his method was working on the different data sets. And so recount two is from 2017. And that one had access to 70,000 70, um, human RNA-seq samples, which I thought it was a, like an incredible amount of data. Um, um, but like people keep generating data. And so we now are uh, basically finishing the recount tree uh, resource, which is gonna have access to over 700,000 human and mouse RNA-seq samples. Um, and we're already working on an update for it, which is gonna bring us um, over the 1 million uh, uh, mark. And generating, sorry, processing this amount of public data uh, takes a lot of work. Um, and so uh, Chris, Christopher Wilkes, he wrote a system called the monorail system that is able to process all this data uh, across different um, uh, machines and different infrastructures. Um, and you can uh, access the data either from the public archive or like uh, private archives such as dbGaP. Um, process all the data, then aggregate it uh, at a, a low cost. Um, and so this system that he wrote, for example, like he has some images where um, he was processing uh, data at the rate of four terabytes per hour, um, um, which is how you're able to, to process over 700,000 samples. Um, and so this involves a lot of code that's not R, right? Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that is outside of R. But, what, but once we have all the, all the results from the monorail system, I wrote the, uh, the R package called Recon Tree that then allows you to access the specific portions um, um, of the data and make it actually easy for people to, to use the data. Um, um, and so the, the raw files, I mean, sorry, some of the files that were processed by the monorail system in the end are these text files that we organized um, such that like if people want to use them outside of R, they can, right? But like we have like a gene count file, an exon count file, like three different files for the junctions, five different files for the sample metadata. Then we have a file for the gene annotation, another file for, for the exon annotation. So there's a lot of files, files. Um, uh, but we want, we want people to be able to use the data without having to like get like a lot of training on like what, how do you, you know, how do you access all these, um, all these different files, what they mean, et cetera. And so the, the recount tree bioconductor package, just with this, a couple lines of code, you can install it, load it, find what are all the different available projects that we have. And then let's say you selected one that is like, that has the ID SRP009615. Um, and so with that, you can easily like then um, um, create this range summarized experiment object, which is um, the R object that is widely used for expression data uh, in the bioconductor world. Um, and like with that, then you can, you know, start doing all your downstream analysis. And so just as easily you can then get data for a different uh, study. So this, I think it has, uh, like Recon2, I've already seen that it's, it allows researchers from access to, to, um, um, to smaller computational infrastructures to be able to actually use the data. Um, um, so in a way it's like de democratizing the access, democratizing the access to uh, expression data. Um, and so one example of what you can, use uh, uh, or, or see with like expression measurements across thousands of samples in this particular image, there's, uh, we're using 41,000 samples. So like I just told you about a project that has 12 samples. This one has 41,000, right? Uh, um, over here, we can uh, see like a PCA plot of the expression of these 41,000 samples and across different tissues. And something that you can see is like this light blue over here is blood, which is like uh, quite variable. Um, it's, most, it's mostly explaining PC number one. Um, 
but then like the brain, the different regions of the brain are this dark blue over here, which is much more concentrated and much more homogeneous compared to the other tissues. Um, so this is just like teaser of what you can get with recon tree. Um, and so with that, I want to acknowledge all the people that uh, work with me. Um, none of the projects that I told you uh, about could be done just by one person, right? They involve like people from many different expertise. Um, and so in, in this photo, we, we see Andrew Jaffe, Kerry Martinovich, uh, Stephanie Hicks, um, Lucas Weber, um, Kristen Maynard and myself uh, uh, celebrating after we finished the special transatomics paper before the pandemic. Um, uh, which actually was our last picture outside. <laughs> um, um, and then uh, on the recon tree side, Christopher Wilkes, he wrote the monorail system uh, and he's leading the recon tree uh, um, project. Um, all the recon tree comes from this family of recon projects that has involved people from um, several labs at Hopkins and Oregon. Um, so with that, I'd like to end, um, I'll just show you one last uh, teaser, which is if you're interested in making arm bioconductor packages, I made a bioconductor package that helps you do that. Um, so I have a couple of uh, uh, YouTube videos on this, or I mean, there's also documentation about it. Um, so um, thank you very much. Um, and I don't know if you have some questions. I see one on the chat from um, Sean Browning, which says, how is the process of converting the raw sequence data into something you can visualize use cluster methods on in R? Are those pipelines you all developed in-house or are they provided in a package of some sort? Um, so um, like for example, with recount tree, um, we wanna generate what are called range summarized experiment objects. Why do we want to do that? That's because the bioconductor um, world um, is really, really relies on S4 classes from R. And they use the S4 system for being able to develop methods that can then be expanded by downstream packages. Um, and they also try to, um, the bioconductor project is funded by a grant where they have, they hire a couple of people and they write, um, core infrastructure R packages that like specify classes like this one. Um, and they, that is useful because then people are able to develop visualization methods or clustering methods that use that same uh, class um, and then generate their results. So if you generate a range summarized experiment object, for example, there's like, several, I'm just gonna say a number, like there's over maybe 10 R packages or bioconductor packages that you can then use for clustering the data and um, um, or visualizing it. Um, so um, in our particular case, um, um, uh, for the spatial transatomics project, so let's say, um, um, I'm trying to find this line. Mm -hmm. So, oops. Um, so for example, these um, uh, either on, uh, yeah, the unsupervised um, result over here, that's using um, an, a bioconductor package called SCRAN, which was developed for single cell um, um, expression and analysis. Um, and so that package, uh, uh, uses some of the same methods that we use for providing um, our spatial transatomics data, right? Um, so we didn't have to write everything from scratch, right? We're able to use this bioconductor ecosystem uh, to then analyze our data. Um, and so actually, uh, um, like we were the first people to release uh, data on spatial transatomics. And now as of today, there's a preprint called Spatial Experiment. That Spatial Experiment preprint um, is about a new bioconductor um, class um, that will be able to contain the information needed for visualizing um, spatial transcriptomics data. Um, so um, I, I didn't know it was gonna get post, like appear today specifically, 
but uh, I guess it's like perfect timing. Let me let me um um just show you the, the image of it. Um, Mm -hmm. Sorry, my computer's taking a bit of time to exit um, the full screen mode. Um, and yeah, we like to tweet a lot. Uh, so uh, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, and so um and this is from the tweet is from seven hours ago um so yeah this these appeared today which is like um which is a new bioconductor package for uh, con uh for providing infrastructure for containing this type of data right um and so um uh -huh. Like we try to make everything open source, try to help other people like uh, analyze the same type of data, right? Um, like as a community in Bioconductor, we like teach a lot of courses, a lot of um, um, workshops where we try to get new people interested in, in using our software, uh, but also hear from the community, what are the things they're interested in, how we can try to make them better, right? Um, so like the slide that I showed, on, on, on recon tree code, right? We spent a lot of time thinking about exactly how to make that R package such that like, um, uh, like downstream users wouldn't necessarily need to like dive into a lot of code, right? It really involves two um, functions, available projects and create RSC, right? Um, so, um, but like you can always get into the weeds of it and there's gonna be like a ton of code behind the scenes, right? Um, 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 yeah, so, yeah, I don't know if other people have questions. Um, yeah, I'll, thanks so much. I was going to, yeah, open the floor if anybody has any questions before we end. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I guess I'll just uh, show that, like, um, I do have a... Um, uh, I became a, a PI in September of last year. So I'm calling my team the R Bioconductor Power Team Data Science Group. Um, so I made a little website over here um, that has uh, like, we have a lot of boot camps that um, um, like um, for learning more about like um, how to, for example, here do differential expression analysis or like uh, here we, I reviewed the book called How to Be a Modern Scientist. Um, um, and I run an art club uh, that Sabrina mentioned on Fridays and like all the videos, all this, this, this uh, Google sheet is fully public. Um, it's linked from that first website that I mentioned. And so, uh, you know, we, we upload videos to YouTube um, and I'm trying to teach other people in particularly in Mexico, cause that's where I'm from, how to like, um, um, learn more about Biconductor, but also maybe become Biconductor developers themselves. Um, and actually yesterday we announced that we got a grant to fund uh, like all the things that we're gonna do this year. Um, um, so I try to be active on many different fronts, right? Um, and um, um, so you, you, you know, hopefully we might run into each other, uh, uh, maybe at uh, our studio conference, right? Uh, um in the future if we're able to meet in person yeah absolutely looking forward to when that can happen uh in person instead of virtually but yeah awesome well hearing no other questions and uh yeah coming up on on time here i guess uh, we'll end it there and then uh yeah others have questions i'm sorry this is jim durant i know last second but um if you could send a list to these links um, out to the listserv. I think that would be really, um, really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be sure okay. to do that. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Sabrina and Sean for organizing. And um, yeah. I'll see you around on Twitter or in person, maybe. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much for coming, Leo. And, and thank everybody for uh, you know attending today.
and we'll look forward to seeing you all next month. Bye now.